All right, let us open our Bibles to Mark chapter 1. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is here. That's some good news. That's some good news. Let us read there verses uh, 14 and 15. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. As you know, last week, Jesus was tempted by Satan for 40 days and 40 nights As you know, it was the Spirit of God that drove him to be tempted. In a sense, it was like the Holy Spirit threw him him into the ring with Satan. And Jesus overcame every temptation. And now Jesus begins his ministry in regards to his preaching ministry, right? He begins to proclaim the kingdom of God. And he's telling people how they can get in. He says there, repent and believe in the gospel. That's your way in. But we'll get into that in a minute. It begins by saying, after John was put in prison. My question is, why was John the Baptist put in prison? I'll give you two reasons and I'll give you two answers. It's important to understand this because God, as you know, is sovereign and he's in control of the whole scene. What happens to all of his men is under his care and nothing is taken him by surprise. There's a reason why John the Baptist is put in prison. Reason number one, Mark chapter 6 tells us that John the Baptist was imprisoned for continually confronting and rebuking King Herod for unlawfully marrying Herodias, his brother's wife. Right? So there's a form of incest there. There is uh, adultery. It was wrong for Herod to do it. And John the Baptist had no problem in pointing out King Herod's Sin. By the way, anytime the Lord uses someone to pour out our sin, it is a sign of love because the Lord wants us to repent and draw us near. Can I get an amen? It is really a sign of mercy, but that's not the way Herod's wife Herodias saw it. She was angry and she was vengeful. She was filled with rage at John the Baptist. She, she wanted him beheaded and she got what she wanted. John the Baptist was put in prison for being a convicting voice of truth. For being a convicting voice of truth. For calling out sin and preaching repentance. A few months from now, we'll be in Mark chapter 6 and we'll get everything in detail. But that's one of the reasons why he was put in prison. He was a bold prophet. He wasn't afraid of calling people to obedience to God, right? And that's why he was in prison and eventually beheaded. Number two. Again, it was because God is absolutely sovereign. This was the sovereign will of God. You and I might look at that and say, John the Baptist, his death, what a waste of a life. There's no point in dying early, but God had a a plan through it all. Uh, The Lord removed John the Baptist from the scene to make room for who? For Jesus Christ. John said it himself. He said, I must decrease, but, but Christ must Increase. He must increase, I must decrease, and he did all the way to the point of decapitation. They chopped off his head. John the Baptist and Jesus, in a sense, played the roles of Moses and Joshua. These are two prominent figures in the Old Testament, and we'll make some connections in a moment. Uh, Joshua and Moses and Joshua were a John and Jesus type. For example, We're talking about God removing one man and placing another. We saw that with Moses and Joshua. We see that here with uh, John and Jesus. For example, Moses led Israel out of the house of bondage. That is the house of Egypt, right? And into the wilderness for what reason? To meet with God. Then, once he did that, God took his life on Mount Horeb. We find that in Exodus chapter 34. And likewise, we see John the Baptist here, one who led Israel out of the slavery of sin into the Jordan River to meet with Jesus. Then God took his life 
when he put him in prison. And after Moses' death, Joshua led some of Israel from the wilderness into the promised land. Right? And we find here that likewise, after John the Baptist's death, Jesus led some of Israel to glory, to heaven, to salvation, to trust in Jesus Christ. Do you see the parallels there? Right? God used Moses to a certain point and then he took him out of the picture. God used John the Baptist to a certain point and he took him out of the picture. Right? He removed Moses and replaced him with Joshua. He removes uh, John the Baptist and replaces him with Joshua, Jesus Christ. And so we see here that God is in control of the whole scene. You might look at this story and say, poor guy. Like that's a horrible way to die. Because a, a young uh, woman who did some nasty dance, it was something of a strip tease, right? And, and, and Herodias, uh, that's Salome's mom, used that to, to kill uh, John the Baptist. You look at that scene, you think, that's a horrible way to die. But the Lord is in control of all things. And we have to remember as well that, that, John, that John was used by God mightily. But then God was done with him and raised up the Lord Jesus Christ. This reminds us that God has the power to bury men and to raise men up. Right? This is also a reminder that God is in control of every preacher that has ever existed. God will always have a voice of truth. God will always have a man who will speak on his behalf. Right? You think of a, a good man who dies, you say, oh, the Lord says, don't worry, I'm going to raise up another one. And in this case, a far better one. Can I get an amen? amen. And so there's two reasons. One was because he rebuked Herod. And the second one was because God was in complete control and he was replacing him with his son. It says Jesus came to Galilee. I shared with you this last week, but Galilee uh, had a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. Uh, but the Gentiles were in their own districts, right? They were away from the Jewish people. But this region, Galilee, was a large, large region. According to Josephus, Galilee was about 60 by 30 miles, and it had 204 villages with approximately 15,000 people per village. So this approximates up to 3 million plus people in the region of Galilee. So when I thought about that, I thought of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee was known to have lots of fish. So the region of Galilee resembled the Sea of Galilee because there was lots of people. This was a very highly dense place, a lot of people, a lot of traffic, and Jesus started his ministry right there. Again, Galilee was a very dark place. Isaiah 9.2 says regarding Galilee, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, listen, upon them a light. What light? The light of the world has shined. So godless Galilee was the perfect place for the light of the world to begin to shine. Notice the description of Galilee there. They walked in darkness, shadow of death. And all of a sudden you have the sun, S-O-N, rising in full brilliance and power. And the people are like, what in the world is that? The darker the place, the brighter you shine. And Jesus shows up there to show us that he is mighty and powerful and able to save anyone, no matter how dark the place they may be in. Amen. 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 So spiritually speaking, it was as though Galilee was struck with the ninth plague of Egypt. It was that dark. It wasn't just dark. It was, it was deep darkness, deep soul penetrating darkness. The people had no light. Light out for the people in Galilee. It was dark. Again, it was as though they were struck with the ninth plague of Egypt. In Exodus 10.22, it says, There was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt. As you know, this was a judgment on the sun Ra, the sun god Ra. So darkness was, was even felt there in Egypt. It was like walking in a pitch black cloud. I believe to some degree it was like that in Galilee. 
People were walking around. There was darkness that you can feel. There was many demoniacs there. There was, there was false worship all around. The people did not know God. They were so far away from even, even some of the religious institution of Jerusalem. They were, they were gone. Into outer darkness, pitch black darkness, and Christ comes in to shine some light. Pretty amazing, isn't it? This shows us the heart of our Savior. And again, this is one of the reasons why dark hearts don't intimidate me. Dark lives don't intimidate me. Dark minds don't intimidate me. Why? Because I know that Christ is, is powerful. I know that Christ can shine in the darkest places. So when I look at people's lives and you think they're far gone, I don't see it that way. I see that's a perfect candidate for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to show up and shine some light, right? That's the way he saw Galilee, and that's the way we see lost people. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 14 and 15, if you'd like to turn there, you can read that with me. Luke chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Again, this is after the Lord Jesus Christ was um, tempted of the devil. This verse is connected to the verse we just read here in Mark. It says, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Holy Spirit to Galilee. And news of him went out through all the surrounding regions. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Do you see there that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't go into such a dark place without the power, person, and presence of the Holy Spirit? It says there, in the power of the Spirit. I want to remind you, each and every one of us have been called to do certain tasks for God. And this is a reminder that we are to wait upon the Holy Spirit. We are to depend upon the person of the Holy Spirit to do the work that God has called us to do in order for us to be successful. Had Christ gone in there without depending on the Holy Spirit, things wouldn't have gone the way they did. Why? Because Jesus was fully dependent on the Holy Spirit. And so we need the Spirit's power, we need the Spirit's work in our lives if we are to impact anyone around us. Can I get an amen? amen. And news got around. There's no man like this one who has power over demons, who's able to speak in such an authoritative way. It was as though when you heard Jesus, you heard God, because He is God. He's the Word of God made flesh. And the people saw a bright light, something they've never seen before. And they were shocked. They were shocked. And that's the right response. When Jesus shows up in your mind, in your heart, through his word, you should be shocked at how awesome, beautiful, and powerful he is. Amen? His light ought to blind us. Like, wow, nothing like him. Shine bright. It says that he taught in their synagogues. Being glorified by all. I did a little bit of research to see how many synagogues there were in Galilee in Jesus' time. And there were approximately 50 plus. And it's a, it's a possibility that Jesus Christ went to all of those synagogues. Now a synagogue is something of a Jewish church. And there he proclaimed the kingdom of God. And there the people were amazed. It says, being glorified by all. Impressive, isn't it? Jesus' ministry is very, very impressive. A really, really good start. The passage also says Jesus came to Galilee preaching. He came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now the Greek word for preach or preaching is caruso. And it means to herald. It means to proclaim. It's like you're this public announcer, this public broadcaster. You're, you're crying out. You're heralding the good news of God. That's what Jesus Christ was doing. He proclaimed the good news. So we see here that Jesus Christ himself is the ultimate preacher. This is the method that God has chosen to use to win the souls of men. 
And that's the reason why, in many ways, I believe the church has lost much power because we've replaced preaching with entertainment, with skits, with music, and with many other strange things. Not saying that some of these things don't have their place, but in many churches today, preaching has been shot out the window. Jesus was the ultimate preacher. Now, he was not a miracle worker who preached every once in a while. He was a preacher that performed miracles. Many in the charismatic movie, movement today, they focus too much on miracles. Come get your miracle. And, and many of them are, are frauds, as you know. But that's what they focus on, and they neglect the preaching, which is the power of God. And, and so then you have an imbalance. Jesus Christ came to first and foremost preach, herald the truth of heaven. That's what he came to do. He came to plant the truth in people's hearts. Uh, the, the miracles pointed to him being Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah. And he did so because he loved people, right? He's compassionate. And he, anytime he saw someone hurt or broken and they cried out for help, he helped them. But he came to preach. Because listen to me. If you're a broken person today and the Lord heals your physical ailments and yet you get no truth, you get no heaven. So preaching is far above even healing. And this is why Jesus went about preaching, preaching, preaching the word of God, proclaiming the word of God. His main ministry was preaching. He went from place to place to preach. He was an itinerant preacher. It, it has been said that God the Father has only one son and he's a preacher. And this one son has only one job and that's preaching. That's Christ the Lord. This is a picture of Jesus joyfully and passionately preaching from town to town. But what does he preach? He preaches himself. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. He tells the woman at the well, you drink of this water, you're going to thirst again. But I've got water that you know not of. And if you drink from that water, speaking of himself, you will never thirst again. Amen. This is why Jesus asked, yes, give him praise. So when Jesus was out and about preaching himself, he was giving hope to sinners. He was giving hope to sinners. Jesus is the good news. Time and time again, he would preach that he was sent from the Father in heaven down to earth to save sinners. To save sinners from the power and the penalty of sin. Jesus is the good news. Listen, most of these people and pitiable souls were bound by Satan and his kingdom. And yet Jesus Christ, the king, came to set them free. Amen. Came to set them free. Jesus, the son of God there in Galilee, was able to see why everyone was in darkness. He knew the hearts of men. He knew the spiritual temperature of every individual in every city, in every house, in every church. He can read men's hearts and men's minds. He knew exactly who was bound and how, were the bound, how they were bound and why they were bound. And he came to break those chains. And he did that by shining light. How so? Showing his love, preaching the truth. And we can't let go of those methods. Those are the only two methods that win souls of men. Christ's love, Christ's truth. You replace that with anything else, you might end up with a circus. Just letting you know. <laughs> Powerless, unable to do anything for anyone. Jesus Christ preached himself. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is the perfect rule of God. The perfect rule and reign of God. And where does it start? It starts in the individual's heart. You know that you're in the kingdom of God when the king of kings, who is Jesus Christ, sits and reigns and rules in, on the throne of your heart. That's how you know that you are in the kingdom because Christ the king has made a home in you. And he can tell you what to do. And everything he tells us to do is good for us. Amen. The kingdom is first spiritual and then in the millennial reign it is made physical 
So the kingdom starts in us. It is spiritual. You couldn't see the kingdom of Jesus Christ when He came to the earth to set up His spiritual kingdom, but you could see the king. And they crucified Him. But you couldn't see His kingdom. There was no brick and mortar. He wasn't uh, building a city, a kingdom where He would reign, at least not, not now. He was working in the hearts of men. But the Bible teaches in Revelation 20 that someday Jesus Christ will come from heaven to earth and He will set up and establish His kingdom in Israel for 1,000 years. That is coming. But Jesus came to start that kingdom, to kick it off, if you will, to get this thing started, one soul at a time. Let us go to Luke chapter 17. We're going to read verses 20 and 21 to see here that even the Pharisees were confused by this message of the kingdom. Luke 17, 20 and 21. Says, now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would be, he says, when, where, what's up with this kingdom you're talking about? He asked them and said, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus was preaching the kingdom of God. And the Pharisees said, well, where is this kingdom? Where is this place? Point me to it. Where's the building? Where's the throne? Where's the castle? Where's the palace? The Lord says, can't see it with these physical eyes. You must have spiritual eyes. And the kingdom was the body of Christ, the disciples of Jesus, those who were being born again, those who followed the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he told them, listen, it starts within the individual. This is a spiritual kingdom. And as we speak, we are still in this spiritual kingdom, aren't we? And Jesus is indeed the king of our hearts and the king of the church, the king of the world and the king of the universe. So when Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand, that's what he said. He was preaching that the kingdom of God was at hand. He was telling everyone there in Galilee that the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is as close as your hand is what that means. In fact, Jesus was telling the, these people that the kingdom is here and I'm the king. That's what he was saying. The kingdom is here and I'm the king. So repent and believe in the gospel. These are the first words of King Jesus. And it's a command. It's a proclamation. But it's a command. When Jesus becomes the king of our hearts and lives, it is then and only then that we belong again to the spiritual and eventually this physical kingdom of God. No one can say that they belong to the kingdom of God if Jesus can't tell them what to do. No one. But if the Lord Jesus Christ rules and reigns your heart, you are in. You are all in. The good news is that through Jesus, God has come to reign again in our hearts. But, but, we are Welcome to be a part of this amazing kingdom under one condition. Jesus said again, you must repent and believe in the gospel. This is a clear command. Jesus is not coming to make a deal with man. He's not suggesting that they repent and believe. He's telling them to repent and believe. Because he can. Because he's the king. Kings were known to have ultimate rule. And Jesus came to call man to repentance and to faith in his message, in himself, in order for them to be saved. But then again, what does repent mean? I shared last week that it is the Greek word metanoia, a change of mind. That is the most basic understanding of this word repent. Jesus was uh, proclaiming and announcing, 
You need a new mind. You need to change your way of thinking. Because, of course, that's where it starts, right? Light. When the light goes on, the heart follows. And the Lord calls everyone to change their minds, change their lives, and that that would result in a change of life and a change of direction. In other words, repentance means to turn from your sin, to turn from your self, and to turn from this sinful world and its ways and to follow Jesus. But it's not to follow Jesus in some flippant, mystical, mysterious way. It's to follow what he says. In order to follow this king, you must give him your ears. You must be all ears. And that's how you follow him. You follow him by his living example, but you follow him by the teachings that came from his mouth. And this is what changes our lives. It's to, it's to do a 180 degree. It's to turn around completely. It's to, it's to go. It's, it's, it's like you were going east and you turned around and all of a sudden you started going west, right? You were going straight to hell, but you put your faith in Jesus and now you're going straight to heaven. It's a complete turnaround. It's, it's a distinction, again, that God makes between his people and the world. The world is going one way and it's destruction and the church is going another way and it is the path of eternal life right one's on the narrow way one's on the broad way it's to make a 180 degree it's a complete turnaround so to repent is to align your way of thinking with God's way of thinking how does God think well he's revealed it in his word you have no idea what God thinks unless you read this book if anyone thinks that they know how God thinks apart from this book, that's how false religions start. You can't know what God has revealed unless you open this book. And so then that is the call, that is the command, repent. He was telling these people to repent, to repent of their, their pharisaical ways, their Traditions and ceremonies that just brought death, their dependence upon the Abraham's line and their religious works and actions. Jesus was calling them to a complete turnaround, to turn away from um, idol worship and self worship and everything that man gives himself over to. He's saying a complete, they like, drop everything. That's what repent means. Drop Everything that is no good, that is, that is self-sufficient, that is anything that this world gave you, right? Ideologies, false religions, false beliefs. He's saying, just drop the luggage right there before you enter into my kingdom. I'm the gate. I'm the door. You need to come to me. That's what the Lord is basically saying. No one is getting into this kingdom with all that baggage. No false gods allowed. Your pride's not allowed. Your sins are not allowed. None of it. Your goodness, your righteousness, your quote-unquote light and understanding stays outside of this door. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's what he's saying. And that's the reason why people were shocked. Because Jesus was not just telling people to repent and believe, but he was calling the people to himself. We'll find out next week. It tells people, follow me. The Pharisees of that time and the rabbis, that is the Jewish teachers of that time, they wouldn't say, follow me. They would point to other rabbis. Let's follow them. And yeah, follow me like I follow them. But Jesus, no, no, no. He's the rabbi of rabbis. He's the word made flesh. He's the preacher of preachers. He is the king of kings. And he commands people to follow him and to drop everything. And if you were to hold on to anything that is no good, you cannot come in. It's all Jesus or nothing. And if you pay attention to the way we thought before Jesus Christ, and the way some of you think here today without Jesus Christ, it would make perfect sense that we would not be allowed into its kingdom because our hearts are wicked and wretched and dark apart from His power and love. Can I get an amen? amen.
So we are apart from Him. So He says, repent. Change your direction. Change your mind. Change your ways. But again, that's the fruit of faith. That's the result of truly believing in what you've heard about Jesus Christ. Right? So he says, and believe. So to believe means not only acknowledge Jesus. There are so many of you in the world today, well, I believe in Jesus. And all that really means is they have a certain amount of head faith. I believe he's God. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he rose from the dead. I go to church. But to believe in Jesus, to believe in Jesus is to fully trust in him for everything you need. He is your source, the ultimate source. That's what it really means to believe in Jesus for everything you need. A new heart, a new mind, a new path, forgiveness, mercy, grace, wisdom, spiritual power and strength and direction and salvation from eternal hell. What does it mean to believe? It means to believe that Jesus is more than enough. It is to believe that Jesus is sufficient. And if you were to add anything to him, you have messed things up. Amen? Amen. So then faith means to believe with all of your heart, mind, life, and strength, and to follow Jesus with everything that you are, with everything you have within you. It's to believe to believe is to have a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. A genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, you cannot have one without the other. And that is what pop Christianity is all about. It's one without the other, right? It's the Stephen Furtick's of our day. It's the uh, Joe Osteen's of our day. It's the, go ahead, a big name, give me one. T.J. Jakes. T.D. Jakes, Jakes, another one. You guys are getting too happy now. Let this. <laughs> Pastor James pull, pulls out his list. Let's see. <laughs> oh, there's a long list. But that's basically what what many churches are made of. It's it's a church gathering of of belief without repentance. It's belief without repentance. Now, repentance again is the proof of genuine faith. James chapter 2 and verse 9 says that even demons believe in God. The Apostle James was making a very, very important point when he said that. It is so deep what he was referring to when he said that. What he was saying was that demons have faith without repentance. Think about that for a moment. They believed in God. Of course they believed in God. They bowed before Him too, right? But they didn't turn from sin. They didn't turn to God. They were unable to. But they had faith without repentance. So in other words, faith without true repentance is the religion of demons. Faith without repentance is the religion of demons. That is what the Apostle James was teaching. And there are far too many Christians in America today that have the religion of demons. Faith and belief without true sanctification. True ongoing obedience to the Lord. Now the Lord is patient with His people, isn't He? But there are far too many people, I'm telling you, they're no better off than demons. They say that they believe in Jesus, but they don't prove it with the new life. And by the way, the new life is only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. We, we, can't, we can't set it up. We can't conjure it up. We can't make it happen. We surrender. How can I be saved? Lay your life down. Offer him nothing but your whole heart. That dirty heart. And say, clean me. 
Save it. Make me new. If you bring him anything other than that, you will not be allowed into his kingdom. And so there are far too many people, I'm telling you, in pop Christianity, they, they preach faith, but they, they leave out repentance. Repentance has become a, a bad word in many churches. It's become an unfriendly, unpopular word in many pop churches today. But they love the word faith. And they love the word believe. And they love the word trust. But repent? And they might here and there say the word. But what we must understand is repentance isn't just a word. It's a style of preaching. It's a style of preaching. Every time the preacher comes to the pulpit, the whole message is in one sense or another a message of repentance, a continual renewing of the mind and the heart, a continuing submission and obedience to the kingship of Jesus Christ. It's not just a word, it's a lifestyle. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. It's like being dipped into the bathtub, your soul, every time you come before His word. And we all need it, don't we? Yeah. It gets a little dusty out here in Tucson, Arizona. Yeah. So repentance was at the forefront of Jesus' message. It was, the, it was at the forefront of Jesus' message. It was the, the first thing he proclaimed. How is it that we would let go of Jesus' first sermon? This is how he started. This is how he continued. You don't believe me? Read the Beatitudes. Read the Sermon on the Mount. It's a message of repentance and faith. The whole Bible is, really. If I can sum up Genesis to Revelation, it's basically that. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. So it was at the forefront of his preaching. It was at the forefront of the, the preaching of the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles as well. So it's what... It's what uh, the Apostle Paul preached in the book of Acts. Everyone must repent. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 11 to get an idea of how even the Old Testament prophets preached repentance. Now Noah did, Elijah did, Isaiah did, Jeremiah did, David did. Everyone pretty much preached repentance. Every book in the Bible somehow points to repenting, a turning away, and trusting in God again. Ezekiel 33 and verse 11 says to them, say to them. Think about that. Just, just stop right there. God's already telling Ezekiel what to say. And Jesus said, I, I didn't come on my own authority. The words that come out of my mouth are actually my Father's words. The Father gave Jesus everything to say. So the Father was speaking through the Son, repent and believe in the Gospel. So here we see that God is speaking to Ezekiel and He's saying, Say to them, as I live, saith the Lord. Now, God is eternal. He will always live. He's saying, as sure as I'm alive and I will never die. And then he says this, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. This is the reason why it's called good news. Because God doesn't want us to perish. He says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It says, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your ways, Ezekiel says. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Jesus was echoing, in a sense, the message of Ezekiel. Repent. And believe in the gospel. The good news. 
Here was, if you turn from sin, God will save, God will spare, God will give life to Israel. Listen, any preacher who doesn't call unbelievers to repentance is a phony. And any preacher who doesn't consistently call his people to deeper repentance and deeper faith is a hireling. A spirit-filled preacher preaches holiness unto the Lord. But he doesn't do it with a pharisaical heart and attitude. This isn't a holier-than-thou holier attitude. This isn't speaking down on people. This is calling people to the awesome, beautiful, holy, happy character of God. Amen. Holiness Amen. unto the Lord. Right. Amen? Amen. He preaches repentance and faith to non-believers for their salvation. A preacher preaches repentance and faith to believers for greater measures of sanctification. So we preach to the non-believers, repent and believe to be saved. We preach to the believers, repent and believe to be more like Christ. Sanctification. And we need it. And again, God is patient with our sanctification. He's the, one, he's the one at work in us, isn't he? God is making us more and more like him with every passing day. And today, if there is something you heard and the Holy Spirit prompted your heart to get something right in your life, one thing, something big, something small, only you and God know in the Spirit, right? And the Lord is showing you something today and you repent you change your mind about that attitude you've been having. You change your mind about that lust. You change your mind about that greed. You change your mind about any sin within your heart. You are becoming more sanctified today. It's amazing the way God deals with his people, isn't it? He is good and he is gracious. And every time we come before him, it's just more like Christ. More like Christ. We're going to close with these passages in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 to 19. Moses foretold of this coming preacher, or prophet, a fourth teller, and a fourth teller, Jesus, the king preacher. Deuteronomy 15, uh, 18. Verses 15 to 19. Again, Moses foretold of this prophet, of this preacher. And listen to what he says. This is, this is over a thousand years before Jesus even stepped on the scene. Let us read here in verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet. If your Bible has a capital P, you've got a good Bible because he's the prophet. It says, like me, from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet, capital P, like you from among your brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever, whosoever, right? Whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. Amen. Jesus is saying, repent and believe in the gospel. God the Father in the Old Testament is saying, anyone who rejects him, rejects me. They will stand before me and give an account for their rejection of my son's words. My son's words. He was foretold by Moses and Jesus comes and steps on the scene and he's commanding people to obey and to believe. And Moses says, if anyone ignores this prophet, 
they're going to have to answer to God. The same one that they wish they would never see and hear again will be the same one that will judge them on judgment day because they rejected the sweet, loving, gracious voice of his dear son. He says, okay, you don't want to hear my voice anymore? You don't want to see me burning on this mountain, shaking this mountain? He says, I'm going to do something special for you. I'm going to send my son, my eternal son, put flesh on him, send him down, and he will be sweet. But he will be convicting, and he will be piercing, but he will be sweet. Don't reject him. That's what he's saying. Don't reject him. He's full of grace and truth. And so I'm saying here today, there is someone who has not repented who has not truly trusted in Jesus Christ and, and have bowed down to his royalty and have obeyed his words, do it today. Don't, don't wait. Tomorrow's not promised to you. We could be gone today. Right? Take advantage while you're still breathing. If you are not in Christ today, come to him. Because listen to me. I'm not just reading this book. I'm reading Jesus' command to you. That's what I'm doing. I'm not just giving you information. I'm giving you a command from God the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. Repent and believe in the gospel. Amen? Amen. And if you do, you, you will enter the kingdom. You will enter the kingdom and you will be a part of the family of God. Genuinely, a, a true son and daughter of the living God. And you will be embraced and you will be filled by His Spirit. And He will lead you on this narrow, difficult path all the way through the gates of glory. You believe that? If you are an unbeliever today and the Lord has prompted your heart to repent, believe, please let me know. Let one of us know. We want to disciple you. We want to pray for you. We want to strengthen you, encourage you to keep pressing on and to grow in the knowledge of Christ. For those of you who are already believers and the Lord still told you repent and believe, do it! Repent some more and believe greater. Amen. Do it. Give them praise.